two, one, we're live? Three, two, one. Oh, and we're live. We're live. Oh, we've been live. We've been live. <laughs> I'm here with... live. None other than my best friend. My best college. friend. College. Oh, your best friend. My best friend. Both of our best friends. <laughs> college best friends. Best friends for a while. Haven't seen each other in a while. Yeah. Um, best friends like for a while. It's like five years. We said, we said 10 last night, but I think it's actually 12, right? Because We've look, known each other for 12. We've known each other for 12. We've only been best friends for 10. But we forgot. <laughs> but we haven't seen each other in five until this camping trip, right? That's true. That's true. It's crazy. Down in Kerrville, Texas. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> so Justin is a ninja, ninja master in business. He's got his master's in business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. And But he, his real job, he does... Uh, what you call B2B, business to business sales. Mm -hmm. And or, implementation and architecture, right? In the cloud market. A bunch of other yeah. stuff. But he, he, his business sells and does stuff to help other businesses. Right. Whereas uh, what we're going to talk about, how to sell a board game or another physical product costing around $50 or what, whatever. B2C. Selling a physical product from a business to a customer. Cons customer, and, consumer. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So Why we're going to talk about... Say ninja, it makes me think of... That uh, Ninja Turtle song, Ninja, Ninja, Rap, Ninja. Oh, I love the turtles. That's one of my favorite. Above my computer at home, I have the four. They're actually baby Ninja Turtles. It's yeah. Like, I don't. I don't know if I've shown you the picture, okay. but it's it's all four of the turtles: Michelangelo, Leonardo, Donatello, and Raphael. And Raphael. And yeah. they're all babies. He's got the attitude. But they still got like they they're all ready to to take on the world type of attitude. It's really cool. I Do gotta you, send you. A picture. You gotta show me a picture, right? Because. Uh, for the audience or for the viewers out there, right? Uh, Calvin, I. What's cool about and a little story about our best friend, Ship, <laughs> is while we were uh, senior year of college, he had this. Uh, Calvin was an art major, right? And uh, what do they call it? The ceramics was your project, right? And you had like a bunch of little characters and stuff like that for your uh, college project. Real quick, yeah. So. I made these characters in ceramics for my senior show. I was a studio art major. Yeah. So I did painting, ceramics, drawing, whatever. And my senior show was ceramics. I did these creatures, as Justin's talking about. So cool. They were based off or inspired by my grandma's stories. Oh, I didn't know that. Which is also why... You do the board game. The board game yeah. is uh, inspired by Meemaw's Monsters. That's the name of the board game. Inspire, I did inspired not know by that. My grandma's stories she would tell us as kids and still tells me. You know, what's funny is I, I walked into Ron Brown's office, right, financial wow. director at UHB, uh, visiting for uh, Debbie B's funeral and stuff. Yeah, yeah he has yeah. one, doesn't he? Yes, so I, <laughs> I I'm forgot. admiring all the caricatures, right? Ron, anything, it, it, what people need to know about Ron, he's a pretty eccentric, fun guy, right? He loves to decorate. He's also a clean freak, which I love, right? Some people find it annoying. I love it. Uh, it's, just, it's just what makes Ron Ron. And I'm walking through his office, and he's got these cool built-in shelves and stuff. And I saw this character. It's kind of like <laughs> it's narrow. It's a cylinder, and it has this hair that just goes bloop. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's got like two braids. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, little chiseled teeth. What I was, was like, his name? Oh, you know, I, I, don't I don't remember. I don't think he had the card. Then. I don't think he had the card right there. I can't I remember what I named. And they had him. I had fun names for some of them. One of them I had. Half of his body was a was a happy face. Yeah. The other half was a sad face. Yeah. And I called him Sappy. Yeah. Who, and that was my favorite one and also the one I dedicated, or I don't know if dedicated is the right word. I gave it to my grandma and grandpa because that's the one they also liked the most. Cool. And because they were inspired by them, by my grandma's stories, they have it. So yeah. every time I go to see them, I get to see Sappy. Sappy's there. And I turn it to Happy well, guess where, in case they have it. Sappy. Guess where Rocky is, right? Well, at least the one I named Rocky. He's at, where? My, he's at my house still. Really? Yeah. So... But yeah, <laughs> That's so uh, the, the whole all the whole full circle of this uh, little rabbit hole we went through was I admired this character, which I called Rocky. I don't know if everybody's ever seen um, the Never Ending Story, where that have, uh, character, that rock, comes out of the ground and he can talk, right? But anyway, that's what it reminded me of, and it's this it's this blue gray kind of white earthy colors, uh, and it's this. Uh, kind of a rock character he's got two eyes and a mouth and he's this big mold and it comes down to these feet and these feet have little like dots all around him and I know this because I studied it so much every time I come into Calvin's room I would like play with this guy while I'm talking to Calvin <laughs> play with them and so what did Calvin do graduation do? day you went off with oh the we graduated line. on the same day right? yeah we graduated on the same yeah. day like May He was 20... a year behind me, but I was a little slow finishing. So no, May, 20, <laughs> May 2010, right? I forget what the date, like sometime within the first two weeks, right? We graduate. I wake up, 
Calvin's already gone. I, I don't know why or whatever, right? We were getting dressed differently. And guess what I found on my dresser? What? Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> but I just like, that was That's such a cool, awesome. I, was a I, cool I, gift. I forgot that story. It was a really, really cool and thoughtful gift because, you know, you just knew that you, you took a, you took attention to the fact that I liked it. That's and awesome. Yeah, so. And so now I've made the ceramics, you know, fast forward eight years. Well, God, just, what has it been? It actually, like yeah, it was eight years. Yeah, eight years. I first started working on Nemo's Monsters, the card game, I don't know, seven years ago, eight years, nine years. Even when I was in college, I think I, no, I started working on it when I was working. Anyway, yeah. didn't work. Went through several different versions of Nemo's Monsters. Now I'm back to this new one I'm working on. Who knows? It may or may not work. And this is the board game thing. This is the board game, but as I'm ma as I'm making it the prototype, so basically the rough draft of the game, uh -huh. I'm thinking, I'm constantly thinking, how can I, how will I sell this if I do end up thinking I should sell this, or if it's fun enough for me to want to self-publish and start selling to people. Right. And also, I'm getting through Streamline Gaming. Which is I guess your site that you built, right? So that, yeah, Streamline Gaming is a site I built that uh, teaches people how to make and sell a game. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm super into all the marketing. Just It's like a hobby of mine and also prototyping. I love those two parts of, of game making. And so I, uh, where was I going with this? <laughs> oh, I'm trying to s figure out how to sell the game. And also through Streamline Gaming, I've had a couple people here and there ask me, I have a game, but I need to sell, I want to learn how to sell it, how to build an audience, where do I start? And I've actually, I've probably gotten that a hand, handful of times over the last year and a half. Nice. And it's actually interesting because I think that's where a lot of game designers and a lot of people that have a product uh, that they're wanting to sell to a consumer, uh -huh. uh, they have they have the idea, or in and sometimes they even have the product, okay. which is even better, you know, way better than just an idea. But they have the product and they're ready to sell it, but they don't have anybody to sell it to, and you can't just put it on eBay and expect it to go off. You have right. to drive how, traffic to that. How do you drive some motivation platform. towards that? Exactly, yeah. So that's yeah. kind of what we're going to be talking about is you're going to be asking me questions from a, yeah. a biz, master business person <laughs> <laughs> through your mindset and trying to get my input on how I plan to market my game and how I've seen other game designers who have successfully marketed their game and how they do it. So that's what... So I'm going to... I'm gonna pass this over to Justin here, and he's gonna take over asking me questions. Yeah, an invisible mic. Yeah, is over here. we found him. We found him. Thank. You. Oh yeah. I, I they, somebody returned him to the store up top. We lost right? our so keys. So I don't know where they came from, like but two, somebody called and, two and a half returned hours. him. So and it was awesome. Thank you for asking. Right before we were calling the Mazda, was it Mazda dealer? Or we called the Mazda. Dealer. Yeah, we called the Mazda dealer. We were oh, lost freaking keys out. Right They're like, well, to make a new key, you have to bring your car. <laughs> Yeah, your vehicle we're like, in. We're 45 miles away, so like, that's a well, that's a four or five hundred, maybe even six hundred dollar tow fee. Tow it to 45 miles, get it, get the new key made. Anyway, it was a big. All this starts on Monday, by the way. It's Saturday, so we're laying in the tent, like, well, okay, <laughs> and, okay, and, and I'm okay. We had just ravaged the campsite. Two, What'd you call three it? Times. The the Easter egg hunt that had Easter no egg, egg hunt that had <laughs> no egg out there. It ended up being in the office. Anyway, yeah. Right when we're trying to figure out our, our plan B and plan C and plan D, oh my gosh. I go, okay, Justin, I was in a bad place let's either. have, I was in a bad place. let's take 30 minutes. Let's take 30 minutes. 30 minutes. It was like 1.30. I said, let's take 30 minutes, 2 yeah. o'clock, maybe 2.30. Yeah. Then we can start panicking. <laughs> I was like, because if someone picked up the keys down by the river where we thought we left them, yeah. it, they might have like not been in a hurry to return them to anybody or not known to where to, yeah, they, Hey, like let's go. yeah, let's go return the keys. But first, I want to eat. My yeah, that's more important. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we found our keys. We had some people, thankfully, helping us look. I guess. Yeah, it's interested. it's cool. Like the camping community. Honestly, this is like, that's like marketing. Like we were marketing that we had lost our keys, and people started. It was word of mouth. Kind of, yeah, it was word, word of mouth. mouth. Yeah, actually, the the most like uh, grassroots way of marketing, which I think is like actually one of the most pivotal ways to get something going, like something to catch fire. Ooh, I have a right. good point to that for as far as like selling a physical product, such as a board game. A lot of the game designers, they and people selling trying to sell a product, they'll be a part of the community, and what that means typically in the board game world is you get a part of forums right. where your target audience, your the potential customer would be mm -hmm. 
and you just kind of start uh, developing relationships through the forums by answering questions, just being part of the community. And a good place to start with this in the board game world is the Facebook. There's five to ten pretty good Facebook pages for board okay. game design and board games in general. And then there's actual forums separate from Facebook, right? Forums on uh, Board Game Geek, which is like probably one of the most popular places to, yeah. to for forums in the board game world. I don't use them a lot because I just I I find their interface pretty clunky? difficult, clunky. Okay. It's okay. They, they, were, they started in 2000, I believe, like the exact, the year 2000. Dot com boom. And <laughs> their website has, doesn't seem to have been kept up. Wait. Yeah. Okay. And I don't, there's nothing wrong with it. It has some really good information. I just have trouble. It's funny that you mentioned the, the, the whole forums and becoming an influencer of their industry because the same thing translates in the B2B world, right? Where we have um, certain conferences that people go to every year and they look forward to it because it's the unveiling of the new features, new product sets. They basically think of it as a timeline where, let's say one of those events closes, right? That's like the new, uh, not fiscal year, but feature year for everybody to develop the product set just to be ready for the new launch of that next conference, ah. right? So, so that's... for board game world terms, mm -hmm. the, our, con our big conferences are like Gen Con, Origins, there's yeah. in the UK Expo, which so, is in the UK. But there's a couple of these really big conferences. And really, the good thing is you don't have to start out at a big conference, especially when you're a first time. You're a one man crew, mm -hmm. one, one woman crew, and you're trying to get your product to a customer. You can just go to the local regional, yeah, regional 50 events. to 150 attendees. Like It doesn't have to be big or fancy. Nice. And just start demoing your game or showing off your product, yeah. whatever that product may be. Um, and that's that's really now are those settings the, where like they have like blocks of time like hey give, give this game four hours and have fun kind of thing typically or at these smaller conventions you will you'll sit down you, you'll talk to the event organizer and they'll either say well you can just play in those tables over there if it's really small or they'll say you know pay fifty dollars to have your own table and then you can like you a know, display. get a sign a display yeah oh and sweet. you set up your game so my game I have a prototype in the in my camping bag carrying it around for good karma or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so if I were to want to show that off at a local convention like Austin Board Game Bash, which I kind of want to do in in August. That would exciting. be cool. Yeah. So I would get a table. I would set it up uh, as people come by and see me and see my game and say, hey, do you want to play this two-player asymmetrical tower defense card game? And either yeah or no. And they would leave or they would say, yeah, sure, let's play. And it's also based off of my meme or whatever. I'd, yeah. The theme is cool too to me. Um, it's Meemaw's stories, huh? right? Meemaw's yeah, stories. Yeah, based off of Meemaw's stories. So, just real quick, I probably have talked about this before, but the game is like so. Meemaw tells us the stories before we go to bed, and then the game takes place, which I think is cool. The game takes place in our dreams and slash nightmares, and so we relive these these stories that she told us right. in the game, and we take we 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 are characters in the stories and. And the end of the game is the, the kids waking up from these nightmares or, or oh, dreams. I didn't know that. So that's that. how they, the game ends, even though it's more like you kill the boss and you wake up. So nice, it's, nice. It's, it's interesting. I me. like that. Yeah, I like that. I can dig it. I can um, dig it. So uh, moving to the marketing side of it, right, um, you obviously know a lot about uh, where uh, maybe some of those influencers or maybe where you can pick up traction. Um, we used to have this fam uh, family. We were kind of more like a family in college, right? We had this rent house. It was Pat. Calvin and I, and while I was in the throes of my marketing major junior and senior year, this uh, prevailing term called target market <laughs> yeah. became, like a, our new became like a family joke or inside joke, if you will, because everything was like, well, you got to find your target market. And I was <laughs> like, just, I was just be there like, like the whole time, like, and finally I go, I don't, I just, I don't know what a target market is. <laughs> <laughs> and Basically, was, you're, the person you're trying to sell your... Product. Yeah, yeah, and there's formulas and ways of, there's like constructs and parameters and ways you test it and figure out who really is your target market because if you are, if you don't have one, then you have this shotgun strategy where you're just, you ever heard the term, you just throw everything at the wall and see what sticks? Well, that's not a really, or hope, flo hope don't float, brother, right? Kind of thing. And so, um, really segmenting and understanding, okay, who's the audience I'm trying to capture, right? Who would be in, in most business cases, maybe not, this is not your end goal, but like, where is my rich form of revenue? 
right? Where is that, they call it low hanging fruit? Where can I make the most dollars? Where are the people that are ready to buy a game like yeah. what you're making? Exactly. If that's, if that's your goal is to go for revenue and go for, um, uh, just to sustain yourself through this business, right? Um, but nonetheless, right? Um, target market, like, where do you see? I mean, people so that game six market, plus, you know, the whatever. people that I think that's interesting that you asked me that the people that I think would want to buy a game like this would be people that like trading card games or people that like two player card games like mm. Magic the Gathering, Epic, which is a game I play a lot. Uh, I used to play World of Warcraft trading card game, but anyway, like a trading card game, it's me versus a person. And in my 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 past, I usually like that because it's a competitive thing. I'm very competitive. Yeah. But also, you can play it two player casually. Um, so my target market, the person I'm trying to sell it to, would be someone that likes those type of games. So if uh, so I'm wanting if, to run a Facebook ad, or if I'm running wanting yeah. to run ads, I would want to target people that like Magic the Gathering because that's a similar game a, it's it my game is my game is probably the theme is a lot more casual than magic the gathering okay but the, the it has a lot of inspiration from these card games like hearthstone magic the gathering so my target market would be those people that play that game because the mechanics in my game are actually very much like they're it's just i naturally have those in my game design because i love those games and i've played them Gosh. semi-professionally even for years Gotcha. I got a couple more questions right uh, around that. Like one is when I think of Meemaw's Nightmares, and I think of uh, you and your brothers going into Dream State and then playing through that. Right, I think of multiple characters. So is your game? And I don't know this, right? Um, one player versus another player, or is it a players versus somebody that's going to be a monster? Like, can you have like three three players, like your three brothers, versus uh, somebody else, a fourth player playing the monster? Right? Is it kind of like that interactive, or it is? Is it face to face? So right now it's face to face. It's just two players. It's asymmetrical, meaning both sides play different. So one In this person's example, the monster. One person's the monster. The other person's the defense. So if I'm the defense, I have nine towers or whatever in a base. Ah. And I have cards that are like characters. Like I would have a card that would be Calvin. I would be in my own game <laughs> or whatever. And I, I cast Calvin and he does some spell to help keep the monsters from killing my towers. Justin gotcha. would have monsters that are like a big scary troll who's, who he would put in one, in one of the three lanes that the monsters are trying to attack and eventually kill my base before I destroy his boss and wake up. Gotcha. Which ends gotcha. the game. And then we would switch spots. We'd see how many points Justin got on offense, and then I would go on offense and see how many points I got on offense. So sorry to sorry to distract for no, the, the marketing stuff, but I think the mechanics was was cool, and I'm just trying to like picture how I would if I was walking through a store, how I would see this advertised on a box, right? You see games are like five ages of five plus, right? Ages of twelve plus. I see this game as being like you know ages of kind of 12 or 13 plus, right? Because it takes strategy, right? right? And then what I also think is and stay with me on this analogy right because maybe it's just um, very, very very rudimentary right but there's popular games out there just like there's popular movies right um, and thinking like B2C products when I go to Amazon or I go to Walmart or like anything online what something that I've I recently started to do and maybe it's because people are just like sucking me dry of money or something I gotta be careful uh, but when I buy something they have this feature of like people also bought right kind of like when you buy a movie or you stream something people also they found this movie to be fascinating as well and it's almost linked it's kind of the same genre so how does and we if we haven't found that out we need to research how does one like you go to like a uh, somebody buys a board game on Amazon or buys some uh, board game at a popular website or anywhere and how do you get mixed to the people also so like for Amazon for example um, that's actually a really good question um, I would guess so on Amazon, you you click the, you want to buy this product. Say you want say I put my product on Amazon. You find it. Actually, let's do a better example. Okay. I put my product on Amazon. A person that's never heard of my, my of Meemaw's Monsters, um, they go and buy Magic the Gathering cards. Right. Right. How do I get Meemaw's Monsters in that people who also bought? That's what I'm saying. Right. Um, my guess is, and I don't actually know this, but my guess is Amazon has an algorithm that uh, notices, that actually shows you people who also bought this item. 
there are ads ad spots on Amazon. I didn't know if you could pay for that slot. I'm not sure slot. if that slot is a sponsored slot, meaning sponsored meaning I can buy an ad for it. There are some like that. Okay. I think the the most typical place that you would buy a sponsored ad and again I could be wrong. I haven't looked too much into this is whenever a, a customer say that same person who was buying the magic cards, the magic the gathering cards, they typed into Amazon two player trade two player card game. Okay. I could pay for that keyword two player card game. And that's how and you I would show place. up sponsored Meemaw's Monsters two player tower defense card game or whatever. So that's one of the ways okay. you would buy keywords on Amazon and then your product would show up. Okay, okay. So what what marketing have you thought of thus far? Like beyond so, some of that stuff that That's we a good idea. Let's we'll, we'll we'll bring it back. So we're yeah. talking about selling the product. Let's talk about building the audience, which is I guess where marketing starts. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm developing this product. Uh, and other people have started developing their product. They're getting close to having a product. Their game's about, they're play tested their game. It's fun. People are asking to buy it, which is really cool. I haven't, I mean, maybe I've had one or two people ask me, not with this game, but with previous okay. games I've had, how can I buy your game? And it's like, whoa, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> like, yeah. you actually want to buy my game? That's neat. As a creator, um, what were we talking about? <laughs> oh, building the audience. Yeah. Um, so where, where do you start is usually the question I get. And I, in the past, I, I suggest several places to start, but before I tell you the places, I like also reminding the person that just start with one of these. Okay. Start with whatever one of them, or even two or three that you're comfortable with. Don't jump into building an audience by thinking I have to have a Twitter account, a Facebook account, Instagram, Snapchat, and all this, a blog, a website, whatever. It's way overwhelming. Yeah. I learned that by making Streamline Gaming. You know, I thought, oh, I'll just make content and then put it in the different social media. Yeah, it's way the more difficult than that. Oh, and okay. time, it's mostly more time consuming than I thought. I mean, it's kind it's of a simple concept, but mm -hmm. it's, yeah. It's also build, you have to write creative text around that link and mm -hmm. stuff. So the places that I would start for a board game product, if, you, if you're making a board game and you're wanting to sell it or another physical product similar to that, I would start with one to three of the following, which is Facebook page, Yeah. which for me, I don't have a Facebook page for Meemaw's Monsters, but I have one for Streamline Gaming where I'm basically documenting this process of, of making and selling my game if I get to that point. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to build awareness that way and also it's just kind of interesting mm -hmm. like Anything I'd want to tell my mom like hey mom. Uh, I have this new card. I want to show you that I, and try out this new Monster or whatever Anything like that that I would send to her in a text or want to call her and tell her on the phone because that's what we do <laughs> She's like one of my biggest play testers I would just post that on my Facebook page because maybe one or two other people will think it's interesting too, right? Or not, you know so Facebook page, Instagram, for me, I use a personal Instagram account. I debated whether to have an Instagram business account, one. business or mm -hmm. personal. Mm -hmm. I ended up going with, I actually flip-flopped several times, but I ended up going with personal because for Instagram, for me, I just felt that would be more entertaining. All right. For me, I, I would have more stuff to post. I don't know. So, okay, so let's, uh, we'll talk about, we're kind of, you know, hopping to and from. Uh, marketing to the mechanics of the game then to the the marketing mediums right how do you engage your audience everything like that um, what do you think has been and how long have you been working on this project this specific board game so you've been working should on? I finish the oh sorry just real quick no yeah. I just because I, it, I might forget so Facebook Instagram I'll go faster Facebook yeah. Instagram Twitter reddit is some is there's a lot of traction there, but let's just say Calvin's found some interesting experiences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Reddit, like Reddit's more for build, being in the community rather than telling people about your game. Correct. But Reddit's uh, a good one. Board Game Geek, which is also very similar to Reddit in that it's more of being a part of the community. Uh -huh. Though they also have some forums where you oh. can make your own forum and talk about your design process, uh -huh. which I should probably be doing for Meemaw's Monsters. Okay. I don't, again, because I just don't use that platform. Sure, sure. I don't sure. know. It, again, like, I'm starting with what I know and trying to work up, so maybe yeah. I'll be on Board Game Geek one day. Uh, 
Inst- oh, I said Instagram, Twitter, mm-hmm. or Facebook. Mm-hmm. I got those. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And oh, oh, a website. If that's, I mean, some people think website easy and and stuff. I would suggest a website kind of only if you're really kind of ready to make that jump. It's it's a lot more cost costly and time consuming than you would think. Yeah, um, they make it look easy. I mean, there's a lot of advertisements out there like Squarespace and um, Wiz. I think is the new. Um, Website kind of engine. Wix, yeah. Wix, Wix, sorry. W I X. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of pretty people in the audience or uh, on the uh, advertisement yeah, to try to like catch your eyes and let's get this going. Um, the cool thing yeah. is that you can do it way faster than you used to, but it's Correct. still just like it is time consuming up keeping the content fresh. And I bet you that's a full, because like our, our, my company does this, um, any any enterprise business does this. Like you get on there, it's easy and convenient, but maybe, I mean, Maybe they make it really easy and convenient for X amount of dollars. So there's like upsell feature sets on there, right? And all of a sudden you said you, you go there with a ten dollar a month budget and you're all of a sudden paying thirty dollars a month, right? Yeah. But for something that slick. you could have kind of made somewhat by yourself or yeah. way cheaper over the years. It just depends on where you're at and as far as the launch process I would think, right? If you have a product ready to go and you just want to say, Okay, I'm gonna give it a year and I'm just going to do this and see what happens, maybe, right? But if you're in the beginning stages like you are and you want to like um, match cost over like time and everything. So yeah, I think those are like the top six or seven. Cool. Maybe Snapchat if you're, I, I don't really quite understand Snapchat, that, but that's another one. But those are like the main ones I would suggest. And again, one to three of those just to kind of yeah. get used to posting content, which is actually harder, or it was harder. Well, when I think it's like, that. You know what could be lost in the audience is everybody's looking at this, watching like, okay, yeah, Calvin, right? We get it. Twitter, YouTube, um, oh, YouTube yeah, uh, <laughs> other, other, you know, Facebook, all these mediums, and I get that it's it could be um, harder than it sounds, right? What's cool about what Calvin's doing and what should be noted here is that um, as you're making the game, you are documenting the process on your website, right? On streamingonline.com or where are you? Currently, oh. I'm documenting it mostly, primarily on Facebook. Okay. Secondary on Instagram, but. But as yeah. I'm creating the Facebook posts, I'm copying and pasting that content into my blog, into a draft post. And so I think that's really cool. The idea is I'm going to go through and make several posts later after I figure out how I want to take that direction. But yeah, it's so I'm, unique I'm because I mean, people places. like look. If you're trying to get into this or you have some interest in it, right? Um, Take it from me, right? I learn lessons through my own experiences, and if I can take advantage of somebody else's lessons learned and you know accelerate my uh, gaming process, I I do it. Yeah, and I think it, I I kind of like enjoy learning from other people's mm-hmm. mistakes or and their pro- progress. Well, there's there could be a form of collaboration, right? Because you're responding to people that provide you updates on or like uh, give you feedback on what you're. Posting, yeah. Right? Oh, actually, that's a really good point. I've had several people uh, comment on my my process, me documenting my game, and honestly, I've gotten some really good feedback. Not just like even the simple things, like how how should I, what keyword should I name this ability? Oh, And okay. it's like some people are like, oh, this might this keyword might work, and I'm like, oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> and I'm like, can I use that? And I'm like, yeah, sure, go ahead. Or it, and it's it's been really it's helpful. It's a two-way just street. giving me a second, third, fourth, fifth eye, you uh-huh. know, brain to help me figure out these problem areas in my game design that I'm having trouble getting past. Two, three, four, five minds work better than one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. That's actually been really a very good side effect of me documenting this process in Facebook because I'm trying to do it so up like current like. I make it. Oh, it's okay. Uh, sorry, we're at a campsite and my dog thinks she's a uh, guard dog of the year. We got two guard so, dogs. Yeah. Our, our campsite is very secure. Yeah. The rat uh, pack is what Calvin calls it. I do? <laughs> yeah, I you, you called it. No, you called it that. What's the rat pack? I don't know. You said they're protecting the rat pack. Oh, no, I think I said the pack. Just the pack. Oh, the pack. Oh, I put rats here. <laughs> Sure, I would have chosen. I would chose wolf pack, but yeah, <laughs> yeah wolf pack, pack uh, rat pack. Um. Uh, so okay, so this game. Where are you in the stage of saying it's finalized? Uh, how? I mean, how far? Very far. Uh, I've probably had four rounds of play tests. Percentage wise? Well, I've never. So if I just had to guess, I've never published a game, so that's really difficult. For yeah. Me to guess, but I'm just guessing. I've made four 
big changes to the game, so I've had four weekends of play tests, I believe. Okay. Maybe only three. Oh, okay. <laughs> three or four, I can't even remember now. But the, you're like doing code, like, okay, this is not alpha, it's more beta it's, almost going to... I would say to... it's alpha still. Okay, it's still alpha. It's right. getting a little closer to beta. No, right. it's still alpha. So I, I made a very rough, rough version, and then uh, tested it, knew it wasn't going to be fun, because the first one never is. And it's always broke but uh -huh. i was trying to see what was working what wasn't what mechanics were fun what weren't second weekend same thing third weekend was more about okay i kind of know what's fun and how the, the flow like, of the game the flow how it's working so now i'm going to try to figure out how to balance it more and make, mm. make the cards more make the offensive cards and the defensive cards more equal as opposed to either the offense storming through and me having no chance or the defense just stopping everything. That's what we were talking about last night like over the campfire was that that constant flow right and I think the way it was explained to me Ooh. in a different uh, from a different podcast right uh, hashtag Joe Rogan or whatever <laughs> right <laughs> is that um, and I forget who coined this term, who made it trademark, but you can Google it. And it's this, uh, it's basically like a tunnel or a funnel, right? And it's, it's got a wavy line in it, and that's called the flow mechanism, where you found flow. And if you, if it's too difficult, if the task is too difficult, then you start to get anxious and it says you hit anxiety, right? Right up top, right? But if the task that you're doing is too, I guess, easy, then you hit the concept of boredom so you want to stay <laughs> imitated by cow right so in a, in a way of finding flow it's you're trying to find that that um, I guess that flow compound where it's not too hard and it's not too easy and it's just the right the right sweet spot up amongst the players and everything yeah and for me in my game what I've been noticing is the offense the defensive deck mm -hmm. they've had way they've had a lot of decisions to make their cards and their Ooh. their mechanics they give them a lot. Probably too many options too like many at the grocery options. store. Yeah. Like, which mustard do I want? Just, I don't want Just give me mustard. I don't, I don't, I don't want care which options. one. <laughs> <laughs> so the defense has been high anxiety almost. Like, God too bless. many options. Yeah. And then the monster feedback from what I've been getting is there's just no options. No, I mean, there are options, but virtually no options compared to the defense. Can we get like so, a sneak peek? Like, a, like, is it like throw a torch? Or like, what, what's a what's a good example of like how to defend one monster? Just So, one of... Uh, as I'm getting closer and balancing the cards and the effects better, I'm lowering that amount of decisions for the defense. So I'm having less cards for the defense that say, like, deal three damage or move a monster. Oh, okay. And instead, just having the cards say deal three damage. And the decision making goes more into which of these three out of my seven cards do I play this turn or whatever. Though I still have uh, those choice cards yeah and I'm adding those choices into the monster side which has been low interaction low decision making and I'm adding more of those give this monster hits the tower immediately or this monster summons another monster with it gotcha. to help it over time I, I find this to be down. cool because the only way you find or you figure this stuff out is by playing Right? Yeah. And then I don't know if their evaluation was, man, the monsters, I mean, although they have too many decisions, God bless, they're, they're killing the characters way too easy, or right? Or the monsters are winning way too much. I, I don't know what, how you came to determine this, but you only get it by this experience by playing and then um, having the ability to say, okay, after assessing this play or multiple plays in a specific point in time, let's go ahead and pivot this way, right? Yeah, so for me, like, here's a good example. My last play test, I spent. I would say nine hours with a notebook, with my head, just how the game had been working. Jeez. And I, it's okay, Nori. And I would, uh, I would try to kind of guess slash uh, just balance how much damage I thought the defensive player would do with their towers and their spell cards each turn. Yeah. And then I could figure out from that, you know, they're going to do about 13 damage per turn. So based off of that, now I know how much health of monsters need to be played each turn on average Whoa. so I balanced the monster cards based off of that and then based off of that I figured out and then we had towers in there okay. so then I figured out how many turns the boss will live uh, so I, I was hoping six to eight turns before the game ends and the players wake up uh, so I, I figured out how much attack the monsters should be doing ish a turn gotcha so that they 
go through the towers and are able to to be close to killing the main base before their boss is killed. Uh huh. And so I was balancing those things, and it's just a bunch of educated guessing. Like I kind of knew the flow of the game sure. pretty well, and I kind of had a good guess on on how much health and whatnot, the stats to make the monsters and cards and whatnot. Um, but again, like what you said, as we played it, just playing, you, you have to just play it to figure it out. Yes. Ultimately. Yeah. Having good guesses and a good math framework made the game more fun and enjoyable, and it helped me figure out things better. Okay. Because uh, if I didn't have good math behind it, it would have just been not fun, and we would have been like, I don't know what, why it wasn't Agreed. fun. Agreed. <laughs> which, which, which actually, good grief, I mean, if you try to peel back the onion, um, I mean, we all grew up playing, hopefully most people grew up over here playing Monopoly, Mousetrap, right, uh, Clue. I played uh, all of them. Oh, exactly, right? And, I mean, is this just a, a thought born out of uh, something like you know that you dreamed about to, to document this? Because if I went on to the internet right now and said, "Hey, who are the creators of this?" and could I could I interview them or could I find them? Did they ever document their process? I mean, is that out there or is one? I think the because biggest that's yeah, it could have been so helpful. Cool. You know, I think one of the one of the people I follow is Gary Vaynerchuk. Mm -hmm. Suit for hashtag Gary Vaynerchuk. Ha hashtag Gary V. <laughs> Uh, super entertaining, but also one of the things he talks about is documenting uh, the process of whatever you're doing. And for me, that's game design. Yeah. I haven't published a game. I haven't done anything. But I think, like, just thinking in 10 years if I did make a really cool game, how cool would it be to basically have you, that me, yeah. Justin, be able to go back into my Facebook page or go onto my blog and and see the pro the step by step process as I made this game. Right. What cha what ch uh, what decisions I made. Right. You know, the game could have easily ended up a four player game, but instead I wanted it to k keep it a two player game. Not ever. Not only would it's it be just, enjoyable to watch the process, but like how it may have helped other people that are trying to do the same thing make different decisions to apply to their games or whatever have you. Yeah, right? and I think like some of the things like I shared my the way I I did the math, how I came up with the math. And some people liked it. They thought, you know, that's pretty cool. Sound thing. logic. Yeah, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like, it makes sense that that would make your game more balanced. And as for me personally, I play uh, several. I play a lot of prototypes of other people's games as well. And one of the most frustrating things is to play a game that has a, is a fun idea, but there's just obviously not really any math behind it oh and the game is very broken like the games the game mechanics are fun it's like oh this is a cool idea but why would i ever not do this strategy because it's going to win every time oh. that's me as a competitive player and a game okay. designer and so having hmm. a math structures like even simple addition and whatever math structure hmm. to this game or to your prototype it helps with the play test makes them more fun makes them uh, you know, it's more enjoyable. So it's I'm more wanting, challenging. I'm wanting to help other game designers figure out these kind of things that, when you're play, a lot of play testers don't even know why the game's boring. Like the math is bad, and I I can figure it out because I just I'm you into math many, okay. and I played a lot of games and I'm competitive player, mm -hmm. so just I kind of get the math behind the games. A lot of players they might not. See, I wouldn't. I would. So they would like, just I just play roll the dice and, and have fun. Like, Okay. I mean, it wasn't. They might not think it was fun, but not know why it's fun. And yeah. a lot of times, it goes back to the math. And so I think, as for me, being able to help other new game designers like you or whoever, mm -hmm. I think it'd be so cool that be able to go play someone else's prototype that learned from me, learned cool things from me too, and my experience then be better because they learned how to make it better. No doubt. And I'm not playing a broken prototype that has no math behind it. Nice. So, yeah. Nice. <laughs> really uh, so cool. a bunch of cool things can come out of documenting the process, and I think it's apart from just, hey mom, here's what I'm, here's my latest game uh, idea. You want to play test it with me? Right. Now I can kind of right. share that with others so, too. So walk me through. Okay, you've done four different or three right play weekends, play types, right? Um, making tweaks. Uh, you've noted that, and by the way, we're, we're approaching July, so we're like about a month, a little over a month away from that event in Ooh, Austin. Austin Board Game Bash. Yeah. You're right. Ooh. So, do you think you're going to be ready? I don't think I'll... I always feel like I'm not ready. Okay. So okay. I think... Yeah. Why, though? Why? Here's here's one... Like, I'm very... Uh, 
I guess hard, hard. I'm very self-critical. Maybe sure. I don't. I don't yeah. know what the word you, is. Are you thinking like you're trying to be a perfectionist on this thing? Perfectionist okay. is very one of my probably biggest problems. I guess. Okay. Because sure. it in well, the past. That's your baby, right? You want it to be perfect, so it makes. Sense. For example, a lot of I have had several, probably two games in the past. One of the the first Meemaw's Monsters was actually really fun. I thought, and my brother thought, who were the main play testers, and I wanted to just keep making it a little bit better, a little bit better, keep improving. And then at some point, with both of the games, at some point, the next step to trying to make it that much better, I ended up breaking the entire thing, basically. Really? Like, I would rework something. It wouldn't work. It worked way less better than the previous version. Oh, no. And I would just get burned out and be like, okay, I'm going to make a different game. So I would do this. That's I'd, like I've writing this, a like, novel and then, like, going back and changing a chapter, and you're 150 pages into writing the novel, and you're like, you know what? That, that the chapter book. ruined I'm the done. book. <laughs> Yeah, oh I've done this like six, six, all six of my games and since I've been making games. The last You're kidding! Years. I didn't know this. So what? For me, my so you could be an author of like six books. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, uh, I'm really trying to not publish a mediocre game, like or yeah. a mediocre product. I might, I might write a book. I might make a game. I might. I like being creative, so I want to create something that's of value to whoever wow. purchases it. And I think that's one of the main reasons I'm really critical on, wow. on myself. Because I see in our industry, the game design industry, yeah. the board game industry, no. Kickstarter's big. Yeah, very much so. so. I would imagine so. But in Kickstarter, one of the biggest complaints is, well, half of these games that get Kickstarter, it's like, this wasn't finished. Like, it doesn't feel like a finished game. <laughs> why, why did you Kickstart this? And, oh. and that's not for all of them, but that's my one of my fears. It's like, I'm going to publish something that feels rushed. Okay. Or feels not complete, and so I think that's one of the biggest reasons I'm so. So maybe it's a different perspective of like, maybe maybe you gear up going this Austin board game bash, right? Maybe this is like one of the final tests. Like, get excited about like, what tweaks am I going to figure out this weekend, right? Um, uh, maybe that's the mindset that you did. Oh, uh, I remember why I told you that thing of me breaking the game. Oh, okay. So I'm glad you brought yeah. it back to the Austin board game bash. So I'm worried. It, you asked me if I was going to be ready, and yeah. that's why I'm like, eh, I'm, I'm hoping I've learned from my past, and I'm not going to completely rework something and break the game and just give up. Right. Now I have, I have a pretty good prototyping process now. Good. And so I think even if I did break it and it wasn't fun, I could now, I could, I'm better at being able to revert my changes. Roll back. Roll back. That's what we call it in our industry. How do you roll back after this upgrade? Where, yeah. <laughs> Whereas previously, if I broke it, I'd be like, I don't actually remember where I left off because it's a bunch of... It's so uh, funny. It's, it's applicable to my industry because you're supposed to take a snapshot of what the current code is. And, and what I the would current get lazy. Is. Yeah. Take a snapshot and understand, okay, after this tweak, if it does mess it up yeah. I want to roll back and make sure that it doesn't have to go back to like chapter one kind of thing um, and I think I've done a good job of getting those things in pro well right I think there. your documentation process helps with that yeah Just inherently right and also my document another side great side effect for my documentation process is I'm really like when I feel discouraged about my game I'm like there are people watching you know kind of even if it's like a handful of people. They're counting on you. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> when's the next update? And I'm like, Ugh. I went to a cave to hibernate. Yeah, so like after after my second weekend of play test, yeah. I was kind of defeated. That Monday, oh, okay. I went back to work. Hmm. I was like, it was fun and it had some cool mechanics, but to change it, to make it better, I'm going to have to change basically all of the cards. Mm. And that was a bit overwhelming after creating this thing for a month and a half leading up to that point or a month, month, month and a half. And so I just kind of felt defeated for a day or two or three. Mm -hmm. And then that Friday, I was like, I think this could be fun still. I'm going to rework everything, do that math behind the game, and see if that helps. And it did. Nine hours later, I was like, what's the worst thing that could happen? I'd waste nine hours and then document that I wasted nine hours, you know? Nice. Okay, interesting. And yeah. it still be interesting whether, whether that nine hours was worked out or didn't it would be interesting to the documentation well, what tell i mean at least for me and the, and the viewership out here but uh what is austin board bash or board game bash it's one right? of those smaller conventions i would i think last Do you year know where it's housed at like it's in south austin okay I, I went last year for the first time sweet and i would say this is just, i wasn't ever good at guessing how many m m's were in the jar but right <laughs> i would guess there were how many are in my mouth right now <laughs> 
300 people. That's pretty event. big. That's pretty big. That's pretty big. Okay, maybe it was 75. I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe Somewhere between 75 and 200, 300. 300. Yeah. yeah. But it's a smaller convention. Um, and I saw actually one of my friends who I've helped him with his prototypes before. He was there showing off his prototypes. So, oh. like, so now I'm like, maybe I'll have a prototype to show, show off with him next to him at his table. Or, you know, do you have to sign up and do you have to book and res reserve a spot for the demoing? I'll and all probably that stuff? ask him because, again, it's, it's probably kind of dependent on the particular convention and I've never really asked this convention organizer who's actually really cool yeah. talked about before. He uh I think he would I would just probably pay him to have table space like Michael did, my friend that showed off his prototype oh. or I don't know. I don't think it would be very expensive because there's not a lot of companies and slash designers there showing off their products. It's more people just playing board games. Yeah, it's actually what's I mean is there you know how like there's a major like publishing firms for like textbooks like McGraw Hill and how there's major ma streaming uh, uh, applications out there based on like technology companies like you know Google Play or Spotify or Apple Music, right? Are there like big time publishers out there that are churning out games that you see? Well, you used to see in the brick and mortar like Toys R Us, right? That's now gobbled up by Amazon. Like, where, you know, where do you buy board games nowadays, right? Do you buy them at bookstores and? and stuff right are, are there just some major manufacturers out there that represent in these regional events or or other areas yeah, there, right there's a lot of publishers and these like smaller... who are you competing against right back to the target market and who are you competing against really yeah as far as who the solo game designer trying to publish their own self-publish their own game whether it be through kickstarter or just posting on amazon or what, whatever you However, you end up doing it. Most of the time, it's through a publisher or, it's funny, self, yeah. or a Kickstarter. I don't even know where to go buy a board game these days. I just don't know. We, I, I can't think of where do I go buy. I would buy it online. I th yeah, you know? I think Amazon's taking a big share of that okay. online sales. Um, there, for our industry, we have a lot of brick and mortar still. So a lot of what we would call FLGSs and friendly local gaming stores. Friendly local or gaming stores. LGS local gaming store if they're not friendly. Like yeah. But, but friendly local gaming store. So it's like not like the video game, but like local no, they board have, game. They have board game shops. So oh, I would okay. go. There's a couple in Austin that I go to, and actually they're really good for demoing your game. And when oh by the way, when you demo your game, one of the best ways to for marketing standpoint. Yeah. That other people have found success with is you have your um, you have a sign up email sign up. So as they play test the game, you say, "Hey, you want to sign up for updates on this on this game I'm making?" You can do that here. Just fill out your email address or whatever, and I'll then shoot you some I'll show you. I'll send you emails about the game. So that's one of the best ways uh, to grow your email list, which okay. is another one of those seven, eight things that we mentioned earlier: Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, one of the buckets. blog. Yeah. yeah, it's one of those things. An email list is one of the most important considered right now. One of the most important. I gotta get on your email list. I don't think I'm even on it. Oh, yeah, I, okay. See here, here. Actually, here's the <laughs> sign up form. Right? <laughs> take hey, note. There's take a note. pin right under yeah. my. Oh, I'm glad you said <laughs> that. <laughs> Jay Aguilar. <Yeah. laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so yeah, um, as you're playtesting, you're already there. You're already. If they seem engaged and excited about your game, like genuinely excited, maybe hey, here's a sign up form if you want to sign up. Very cool. And you can even offer them what something for signing up if you want. If some people do, some people don't. Gotcha. You know. But yeah. Gotcha. Uh, oh, but for buying it, a lot of uh, people buy board games on Amazon now or their friendly local gaming store. Those are the neat online or friendly local gaming store usually. Okay. Okay. The publishers they'll go to uh, some bigger conventions usually, some smaller conventions. Is there like and a, they'll have is there like an eight hundred pound gorilla in the market like? This this company that always produces games around the time There's of the year, a game. right? ILO or AEG? I don't know. I can't remember which one. There's a couple. There's probably three to five titans in the okay. industry. Uh, one of them was just valued at millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. I want to say thirty-seven million, and they just got. They're trying to get, get merged. New Oh, are they seeking new venture capital funding or I, I, getting acquired by another I company? don't remember enough about the articles I saw, but one of the biggest board game companies who owns, uh, who bought the company that sold 
Settlers of Catan, which we played in college, I believe. Oh my God! So you remember Catan. that game? Yeah, that was awesome. That was actually like my my gateway board game into the new board That's, game era. That was a fun game. It was man. a fun game. So that their company was huge, okay. and then one of the other bigger companies bought them. Yeah. I think their president retired, and they so they sold. And now that company is looking to get bought out by I don't even know who. Wow. But yeah, there's some titans in the business, and they are typically show up at every big convention, some of the smaller conventions. Cool. And they'll have their booth with their 20 games set up, and you can buy them there. I bring that up, and it's just something, um, just because I come from that B2B world, right? Um, of, and we were just you know, doing a lot of whole well, M&As. And I'm not saying that you would ever do this, right? But have you ever thought about approaching those organizations based on and demoing them for them and getting published under their trademark their contracts and all that stuff right yeah so in Almost. our our industry as a solo game designer i have two options i can self-publish whether that be through kickstarter or whether i just buy 500 of my games and try to sell them which oh, is 500 the minimum for publishing that's, that's pretty much the minimum for a big <clears throat> yeah that's okay you can sell one game at a time, but it's like so cost inefficient that people don't really. So do you it. would sell it to a retail store, who, or like let's say a, a local game store that says, "I want 500 of your games to sell," and sort that's published. So, sort of. Well, yeah, sort of. Okay. Um, but you can self-publish through Kickstarter or by buying the games yourself and trying to find retailers or. Or putting it on Amazon and driving traffic to it if you have a big audience, which most people don't starting out. Right, of course. Um, or you can pitch it to a publisher. And I, I talk a lot about this. I have a couple of really good posts on this. Uh, one of the friends I met playing World of Warcraft, the trading card game, years ago, probably when we were in college, yeah. probably 10, 11 years ago. Jeez. Yeah. Now, yeah. I met him. We both weren't even. We just played games for fun. Like we. He's now the president of one of those publishing companies. Yeah, he's, he's higher, higher up there, and his companies, they go to the bigger conventions. Wow. I wouldn't consider them one of the titans, but they're pretty well known. But to be a president. Passport Game Studios, at Scott Morris. Hey! <laughs> Hashtag Scott Morris. Hashtag Scott Morris. Um, so, yeah, one of the ways to get published is to set up a date, uh, time, whatever. Usually not at a convention, because the publishers are too busy, but somewhere, like... Since Scott and I live in the same city, I could say, hey, Scott, if you ever have an hour or two, would you like to demo or see this prototype? It might fit your catalog, and you can look at their catalog, see what their usually publishers, they'll say, we're looking for a family game, or we're looking for a four-player card game, no two-player card game, so I wouldn't want to pitch to them. But if I, this other company, if Scott's company is looking for a two-player card game, Maybe my game would fit, and I'd say, hey, I have a two-player card game that's been working. You demo for them, they buy, and you get royalties every time they sell or something like that? You, basically, you would, uh, I don't know exactly how it works, but I think you, you you show them the game, and they, if they like it enough, they'll sign a contract with you, and they'll pretty much take over everything. I mean, they'll still want you to help promote it, so you'll still want to yeah. Yeah, yeah, be yeah. an ambassador of the game, but they'll take over, like, making the art for the game. Okay. And then taking it to conventions and putting it on their website and distributing it, which is one of the really hard things. Mm -hmm. So kind of what you said earlier, you take the 500 games. Mm -hmm. Usually they don't go straight to the retailers. They'll go to a distributor. So games are made in China typically. Okay. They're uh, manufactured in China. They'll come over on a boat. It'll take several months process. They'll get to a distributor in the U.S., a distributor in the in Europe or wherever you're selling your game and then from there they'll spread out to oh, the retailers yeah. and the end consumer. Hence the reason they say in real estate location, location, location. Target market. When in Rome? Dude, this has been an awesome yeah, talk. It's like, been great. It's, it's been, been great. We're rolling up on an hour and uh, yeah, so I know we kind of jumped around but mm -hmm. talking about my game and how I'm Basically, so the whole point was to talk about building an audience for, for your game or your product. Yeah. And I kind of just gave examples of how I'm doing it. I don't know if that's the right way to do it, but really anybody out there, if I had one, one thing of advice, it would be start talking about your game in one to three of those channels. Just start talking about your game and get used to talking about your game. Yeah. Because it's hard. Because you don't want to just talk about your game all the time. 
and, so, th- and be about me, me, me. So to that point, right, um, and coming back from like enterprise sales, uh, but not that I know a, a lot, I just, I've had a few experiences. He knows and, a lot. He's um, a master of business. Ninja, 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 ninja business master. <laughs> <laughs> they talk a lot about, uh, especially when you, board games can be fairly complicated, just like um, enterprise software can be, or a company strategy over a specific product. And you really want to find the right use case or the right venue, know your audience, like you're like Calvin saying. But um, something that's very important that I think anybody that's trying to communicate, I would say not trying to sell, because selling resonates and pushing, but trying to um, address an, a need, right? And and the need that Calvin's trying to address, I, my hope was like to bring joy and happiness, right, while in, interacting with friends and family, <coughs> and what have you, right? So if you want to really pitch something uh, that can address a need. Get your elevator pitch down. And what an elevator pitch is, is that if you're in an elevator with somebody and you need to explain your product or feature or whatever in 30 seconds, how would you do that? Example, my elevator pitch right now, it's not perfected, but here okay, it goes. Here we go. 32 1 elevator opens. <laughs> and uh, you get nervous I like and to you make games. To that and the elevator closes. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Plus, I would probably freeze up if I had to do that right now. But. I'm gonna try. Okay, okay, let's try. Okay, but before that though, uh, just to give you some time to think about it, I was watching this uh, comedy uh, two days ago. Uh, Tom Segura, stand up comedian, hashtag Tom Segura, love him, <laughs> right? Saw so him in Denver Live with a buddy uh, of mine, David Adams. Anyway, he just did this Netflix special, and what's so funny about elevators, he goes, Elevators is where common people have power. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, hmm. Isn't it cool how you walk on an elevator and if somebody's approaching, you could just press close? <laughs> and it's slow. <laughs> and if it doesn't, it's the most awkward way because you're like, uh, 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 I don't know how this thing works. <laughs> so, anyway, That's awesome. Elevator, All right, pitch. elevator pitch for me and Mall's Monsters. Here we go. Yeah. You are, are you a publisher? Are you a play tester? What are you right I'm now? what you want me to be. All right, what what sounds good? Let's just say, for all right, I'm in the playtesting phase right now. Yeah. So let's say you're a playtester. I'm at Austin Board Game Bash. Perfect, Here we go. perfect. You're, you're walking up August. to my table. Yeah. I just set up, and I knew people would come walk by, but I never knew, but now it's here, and I'm kind of like, oh, you're, dem- here. you're demoing. Okay, I'm trying to demo my game. How do I get him over here to demo? My, I come up, and I'll ask you the question, what is this game? Oh, so this is Meemaw's Monsters. It's a two-player card game. It's asymmetrical, so that means like it's, we're both playing different sides. Okay. It's based off of my grandma's story she used to tell us as kids. Yeah. The game takes place in a dream or slash nightmare of us reliving that story. And one of us will take on the role of the monsters trying to invade the defensive player who's trying to keep the monsters away from their main base. Would you like to play? Cool. Now, okay, follow-up so, question, just something to think about, right? If I was a uh, new guy like a, like in this scenario and I asked, how long does it take to usually to play? Do you all have an answer for that it, yet? It takes, that's a good question. And something I could add to my elevator pitch or not, or have it as a follow-up thing. Yeah, like, that's yeah. good. Um, so it takes, on average, 20 to 30 minutes for a round. In general, you would play two rounds, both on offense. You would play one offense on ground and one on defense. You would switch spots. Okay, so and compare minutes. your scores. Yep. It's 40 minutes to an hour, but you know it's a demo. You can just play one side and see if you like it, or just play for five minutes and leave. So, I, whenever I'm play testing my game, I know I take. I'm very much aware of play testers, and I and I want to respect their time Absolutely. a lot. Yeah. A lot of game designers They're don't. They're probably poly and touching a lot of games at that time, right? And so I'm very aware that my game isn't the only thing around so I, I I make sure to tell them like if you don't like the game it's okay we'll just play five minutes you can leave and I'll ask them prompting questions if they look bored as they're playing like uh-huh. or just wrap it up for them and have them move on you know if they or don't want to tell me they don't like it whatever um so what were you saying but yeah but like okay like uh, the follow-up question of oh, like how long, how long does it take 20 to uh, 20 minutes per round how many rounds does it take usually to end the game? To see who exactly wins? two rounds. Okay, cool. And then you compare scores. If you're tied, I don't really know what happens yet because <laughs> I haven't got to that There's part. There's there will, there'll be tiebreakers of some dream. sort. Maybe, oh yeah, <laughs> just a dream. Another sixty minutes tiebreaker. <laughs> it's like eight hours later, still slugging it out. You're still in REM sleep. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's the longest nap ever. Yeah. Oh gosh, awesome. So yeah, Very I think cool. I was just thinking of a couple of things I could have probably done to improve that 
quick elevator pitch was, and I already forgot. I interrupted but, you a couple times. No, was, uh, I'd said the player count. That's that's a good one. That's a big one. Yeah. The length. That was a good yep. one, which you asked me about, and that's so maybe I could add that in or not. Usually, I think that's a good. I think that's a so, normal follow-up question. It's a new, anyway. Or it's a normal way to end it. it you explain uh, the description, and I would say, and you know, it's a kind of like a, a two-round situation. Each round is about 20 minutes, where you're looking at about you know 40 to 50 minutes as far as play time. Yeah. Want to play? Uh, yeah, I want to. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sounds fun. Um, oh, but uh, one of the things I could have possibly added was a game that the that my game is like like if you like to play if you like trading card yeah. games like magic the gathering hearthstone like then it. this game has a lot of uh mechanics like that cool. so you might be interested so something like that Sweet. anyway i think that was a it was Prepped. it was roughly 30 seconds yeah. 20 or 30 I seconds i think you were like sub 30 yeah i think it was awesome if you and get I, sub 30 i think i've gotten so used to it because of this documenting like as I'm documenting it, I'm constantly telling people what type of game it is, uh -huh. so they kind of have a little bit of relevance for what I'm talking about in the documentation. Yeah, and with my mom being a teacher and my dad doing a lot of presentations, it was something that uh, was very, um, just that resonated with my, my sister and I, right, who's now a teacher, hey, hashtag Elaine Aggion, right, <laughs> <laughs> uh, is you've really become, they say like brevity is like the master of wit or like, I forget what the analogy, but if you really master something and you really understand it, you can explain it in the simplest terms in the most common language in the shortest amount of time. And I think that that's I probably that's, a product of you mastering what it is and you having a good grasp, right? And I think that's a really good just philosophy for trying to gain awareness and pitch your game is mm -hmm. is to, to make it clear, make it as in entertaining, just, and it doesn't have to always be about your game. You can say, like, how I thought of my game. My game is based off of my grandma's stories. It's an interesting piece of content mm -hmm. that you could tell, you could distribute it to those, one of those channels. His grandma's pretty cool, too. She's awesome. mom. <laughs> Hashtag me mom. <laughs> so cool, yeah. I think uh, we might be able to wrap this up. I mean, what I would like to see, Cal, is uh, maybe we can link up and do like a post Austin uh, board game bash. And that way I have accountability to actually go because yeah. if I don't, then I'll probably chicken out. Like, ah, maybe or, I'll just or go if play. we don't go, we'll have a, a video explanation of why we're not going. <laughs> there you go. Like, yeah. oh, I chicken out. Up. We didn't I ended sign up, up to just her. going and playing and not demoing. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, anyway, I think this is this has been a great conversation, it was fun. man. Yeah, cool stuff, right? Good stuff, that was man. really fun. Thank I like you. it. Yeah. I hope somebody uh, learned something too. I'm yeah. sure they did. Yeah. Fun stuff. Did you learn something? We'll see you next time. All right. See ya. <laughs>